Attached to the contract of every principal artist at the Metropolitan is a typed or mimeographed sheet listing the artist's repertoire. It can be long or short, but the artist is supposed to be up in every part listed there and ready to deliver on a moment's notice. In Lawrence Tibbetts early years with the Met, singers couldn't get away with this today, some artists had a way of listing roles of which they knew only the principal areas. One such part on the Tibbet list was Valentine and Faust. Of course, the day of reckoning came. On a certain fateful Wednesday, Tibbet was given notice he would sing Valentine the following Friday. In a state of panic, he got hold of the score, Maestro Pelletier, and a pot of black coffee. Forty-eight hours later, he was still far from ready to tackle Valentine. What happened at the performance, so far as I know, has never happened at the Metropolitan or on any other stage. Fortunately for Tibbet, the area comes early. On rare occasions, you've seen the orchestra applaud a singer by tapping their bows on the instruments. So far as I know, there's no record that a chorus ever went out of character in a performance to show its approval of an artist, except for Lawrence Tibbet. The Metropolitan Choristers simply forgot they were villagers and blithely led the cheering for the 27-year-old American who so recently had come into their midst. Do you wonder when you hear Tibbet's way with Valentine's Farewell? saved Tibbet's skin. He didn't know Faust, but from hundreds of repetitions, they did, and they carried him through the show, prompting him from fireplaces, treetops, anywhere they could hide and throw him a line. To warrant such a demonstration of love and admiration, the personality and gift must be very great. Tibbet's were. Lawrence Tibbet was born in Bakersfield, California, of 49er stock. He came by his manliness honestly. His father was sheriff of Kern County and was killed trying to rid the locality of bandits. At Manual Arts High School in Los Angeles, Larry sang in the Glee Club and acted in school plays. He joined the Shakespearean troupe of the elder Tyrone Power and might easily have made a brilliant career as a straight actor. But after a stretch in the Navy, he began serious study on his singing and soon found his way to New York. At his audition, he cracked a high note, but a second hearing landed him a Met contract. He made an inconspicuous debut as one of the Jesuits in Boris Gudunov and continued to knock around in small roles for the better part of two seasons. January 2nd, 1925, looms large in the history of this house. On that night, the roof all but came off when Lar Tibbet sang Ford in Falstaff. To most of the audience, the slim young man hiding his smooth face behind an Elizabethan beard was a comparative stranger. But when he'd finished Ford's monologue, he didn't have to wait till next morning. In that moment, he was a star. He sang like one possessed. I tore my heart out, Tibbet later declared. 
Because the veteran Antonio Scotti was singing Falstaff and the management wanted to spare the older man's feelings, Tibbet was not permitted a solo bow until after five curtain calls. The public settled that one, too. He fell heir to many of Scotty's great roles. Scarpia, which for years had been Scotty's personal property. Antonio in Pagliacci. Iago and Otello, which had not been heard at the Metropolitan since the days of Toscanini. He was the Metropolitan's first Simon Bocanegra, and because of Tibbet we came to know this splendid Verdi work.
nor did he neglect Wagner. From the Herald in Lohengrin, he graduated to Kortner in Meistersinger and Wolfram in Tannhäuser. sang as few Americans can. He created the baritone leads in a number of American works, Marymount, In the Pasha's Garden, Kapansaki, and two wonderful operas by Deems Taylor, The King's Henchman and Peter Ibbotson, the latter with Lucrezia Bori and Edward Johnson. The King's Henchman had a libretto by Edna St. Vincent Millay, and here's Tibbet in the rousing ballad from the first act, O Caesar, Great Wert Thou. Oh, and Julius was thy name. Oh, oh, and Julius was thy name. That fell thy way to a fellow's grave and to stormy Britain came. But I would not stand in thy stead, but I'd leave a be quick and dead. Eugene O'Neill's play, The Emperor Jones, was made into an opera, and only Tibbet has sung it at the Metropolitan. Fleeing through the Haitian jungle, all but crazed by the drumbeats of his pursuers, the self-styled emperor knows his numbers up. It was his boast that only a silver bullet could kill him. Now he's brought low and breaks into a spiritual. Sorry, forgive me, Lord. The first Metropolitan Opera stars to make feature-length sound movies were Tibbet and Grace Moore. The first day on the set, Tibbet blew every fuse on the MGM lot. The technician suggested he pipe down. Tibbet, in turn, bade them do something about their equipment. The results? Merely sensational. At his public appearances, women fainted. Lawrence Gilman, the distinguished critic of the New York Herald Tribune, used to say Tibbet in white tie and tails looked as though he'd just come from his coffee in a Park Avenue drawing room. He was the ultimate in elegance as he stood in the curve of a grand piano and delivered a classic like Where Ere You Walk.
Laden with honors, he celebrated 25 years with the Metropolitan, a record very few major artists have attained. He died a year and a half ago. This afternoon, you've heard him sing superb Italian, French, German, and as few Americans ever learn, English. And the thing that shoots through it all is his unmistakable Americanness. Tibbetts was an American voice as surely as Gili's was Italian and Shalyapin's Russian. The late Alexander Wolcott once speculated that someday someone would write the great American symphony. Into it, he said, the composer would put the beating of the waves on the main shore, the wind through the North Carolina pines. Bill Robinson tapping out a tattoo on the dance floor. And if in that great American symphony, Wolcott said, there could be but one speaking voice, that voice should be the voice of Ethel Barrymore. I thought then, and I think now, that the singing voice in that great American symphony would have had to be Lawrence Tibbetts. Like Walt Whitman, he had the sound of America in him. I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear, each one singing his as it should be, blithe and strong, each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else. The day what belongs to the day, at night, the party of young fellows robust friendly, singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs.